Yeah, let's get to it. Philippians chapter 4, verses 8 and 9 today. Uh, I'll ask you to turn there if you're not there already. And once you do, if you're able, I'll have you stand. You can follow along as I read. If not, that's all right. Where you're seated is fine. The Apostle Paul is writing to the church in Philippi and by the Holy Spirit says, verse 8, Finally, brothers and sisters, Whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Whatever, verse 9, you have learned or received, or heard from me, or seen in me, put it into practice, and the God of peace will be with you. Let's pray, if you would join with me. Loving Heavenly Father, would you at this time quiet our minds, settle our hearts, and focus our attention on you and that which you have for us today? Or even now. <laughs> As I hear this feedback, it confirms to me what you ministered to me and spoke to my heart during the worship. And that is that Satan doesn't want us to hear what the Spirit would say to us, your church, today. He will do everything. We're touching on something that is front lines in terms of the enemy's attack on our lives. But you, O oh Lord, are greater that is in us than the enemy that is in the world. So, Lord, keep him away. Do not allow him in any way to distract or do anything that would disrupt our time together today in your word, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. And amen. You can be seated. Thank you. <laughs> I always know the Lord's going to do something when stuff like that happens. It actually starts on Saturday. You have no idea. When I'm preparing, oh my goodness, I, I'm learning, I'm getting to the point now where when the enemy attacks, I'm like, oh wow, Lord, I'm really excited to see what you got in store. So, all right, well, I hope my title, again, doesn't come off as melodramatic, but this is part three of a series we began a couple weeks ago titled, Kill Worry before worry kills you. The reason I chose that title is because the truth of the matter is that worry can literally kill us. Worry can physically affect us. Research has found that anywhere from, get this, uh, percentage. Anywhere from 75 to 98 percent of current mental and physical illness comes from anxiety. The anxious thoughts that we think. And here's why. Anxiety puts our body into physical stress, which in turn stresses and taxes our immune system 
making our bodies and our minds susceptible to illness and disease. It wears us down. Uh, for lack of a better way of saying it, it cannibalizes and even destroys our immune system because this is not the way God made us to be. Anxiety kills, worry kills, fear can literally kill us. Enter today's text where the Apostle Paul lists eight specific things that we're to think on. And the reason is, is that it will renew, even transform our minds. And in so doing, we have here this biblical cure, biblical prescription, if you prefer, for anxiety and fear. And it comes by way of what we're to do, why we're to do it, and perhaps more importantly, how we can actually do it. It's important to understand that whenever God commands us to do anything, He'll also enable us and empower us to do that which He commands us to do. He has to. Otherwise, He would be party to our disobedience. Maybe I need to explain that a little bit. God will never command us, call us, exhort us to do anything without also packaging it with the enabling to do it. That would be cruel, wouldn't it, if you think about it? I mean, we are commanded here by way of the Apostle Paul in Philippians. It's a command. It's a command. I command you. It could be read this way in the original. I command you to not worry about anything, not one single thing. It's in the double negative. It is a command. I command you, do not worry. Now, okay, I'll stop worrying. Thank you very much for reminding me that I... <laughs> How? How am I supposed to stop worrying? Believe you me, I have tried. Everything I've tried doesn't work. God says, I'm going to tell you what to do, why you're to do it, and I'm going to give you the how so that you can do it. Thank God for <laughs> Philippians 4 verses 8 and 9, particularly verse 8. God has used this verse, this passage in my life in a powerful way over the years to overcome my propensity to worry, as I've shared very candidly and very openly with you. I just have this proclivity. It's the way I was brought up. My parents worried about everything. They modeled for me that that's how you handle everything. And they would worry and stress, and boy, did it affect them physically. My dad died of a heart attack. My mom of, you know, kidney failure. And I mean, I watched firsthand, I witnessed firsthand the devastating and deadly effects of anxiety, worry, and fear. What I want to do is start with what we're commanded to do, which we looked at in the previous two verses where Paul says, pray, pray about everything and thank God for anything. That's what we're commanded to do. And the reason that we're commanded to do that is because when I pray about everything and thank God for anything. I'll worry about nothing. Let me say that again, because we get it backwards, don't we? Instead of praying about everything, thanking Him for anything, and worrying about nothing, we worry about everything, don't thank Him for anything, and we don't pray about anything either. And let me 
hasten to point out that this is one of those places in God's Word where we're given this conditional promise. And by that I mean it is predicated upon us doing something, then God in response will give us that which He promises to give us. In this case, it's that peace that transcends all human understanding. It surpasses human understanding. That's the promise. But it's conditional. If I do these things, what things? Pray about everything. Thank Him for anything that I can think of for which I have to be thankful for. And boy, that's a long list, is it not? I think it's even more specific than that. And I'll just take a moment to expound on that. We did talk a little bit about this last week, but I'm of the belief, and I've experienced this in my own life when it comes to my worries and my anxiety and my fear. When you think about it, you realize that you have a lot to be thankful for, specifically all of those times prior in the past where God was so faithful to deliver you from a situation that you were in, a situation that caused you great anxiety, great stress, and God was faithful. God delivered you. God pulled through. God will never fail you. And you think about that and you thank Him for that. And then it's a much needed reminder that if God got me through that, well then He can get me through this. He's the same God yesterday, today, and forever. He will never leave me. He will never forsake me. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And then what happens is in the process of praying and thanking God, there's this change that begins to take place. And again, we did talk about this a little bit last week, but it changes us. And all of a sudden now we no longer, as one said, have stinking thinking where we need a checkup from the neck up. <laughs> had an old boss that used to say that to me all the time. You got stinking thinking, what am I going to do? You need a checkup from the neck up. Okay. So that's what we're commanded to do. And that brings us to the why we're commanded to do it. Simply put, our thought life is so powerful, it can actually determine who and what we become. Again, let me say that in a different way. Our thought life is so powerful, it can actually determine our fate, our destiny. We become what we think. What we think is who we will become. Proverbs 23 verse 7 says that as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. I suppose you could say it this way. We are what we think. We are what we think. It all starts in the battleground of the mind. And that's the problem. Satan knows this, but he doesn't want us to know it. And if we do know it, he wants us to forget that he attacks the mind. He goes right to the mind because he knows how powerful the thought life is. He knows that if he can get us in the mind, he's got us. You can just start the stopwatch. Well, that's an old way to do it. I need to pull out my phone. He can start the app with the stopwatch. Just a matter of time. Because that's where it starts. It was Ralph Waldo Emerson who famously said, 
Sow a thought and you reap an action. Sow an act and you reap a habit. Sow a habit and you reap a character. Sow a character and you reap a destiny. This is why the scriptures are replete when it comes to the importance of our thought lives as a Christian. This is why it is so important to know that the battleground is in the mind. That's the why. That's the why behind the what. Because see, God loves us so much, He doesn't want us to fall prey to the enemy and his attack on the mind, because He knows what it does to us. By the way, that's the way it is with all of God's commands. I think of the Ten Commandments, as one said, they should be seen as the tender commandments. Thou shalt not, because I love you so much, and I don't want you to suffer needlessly at the hands of disobeying my command. It's not so much, don't do this, I command you because I'm God and I said so. No, it's more like this. Don't worry because of what worry will do to you. Don't commit adultery because of what adultery will do to you. And you can take that all the way down the list as far as you need to with every single one of God's commands. It's a tender, loving, heavenly Father who loves us so much. He's trying to spare us of the destruction and the damage that our disobedience brings into our lives. And such is the case with worry. This brings us to the how. It's been said that in order for us to do the what of the Holy Word, we must have the how of the Holy Spirit to empower us. You know, <clears throat> the one that I feel the most sorry for is the Christian who's trying to live the Christian life in the energy of their own strength. The only way to live a holy life is by way of the Holy Spirit who indwells us and empowers us and enables us to live a holy life, to live an obedient life. It's the how of the Holy Spirit empowering us to live a holy life. That's where I want to go with this in the remainder of our time together. I want to look at four hows. Four hows as it relates to killing worry before worry kills us. So four hows specific to how it is that we can be victorious over fear, worry, and anxiety. And, by the way, have the peace of God from the God of peace. That's not a play on words. Notice in verse 7, where Paul says, the promise is that if we pray about everything, thank God for anything, we'll worry about nothing, because the peace of God from the God of peace will guard, set up a guard, a garrison, a protection, a shield about our hearts and minds, keeping us in perfect peace. You know, I've been kind of, uh, forgive me, <laughs> you don't see it, but sometimes the Holy Spirit, uh, I hate to say this, please don't think of me differently when I do, but sometimes I'll be up here and I'm looking at my notes and the Holy Spirit's going, I want you to say this. And I'm like, 
Lord, that's not in my notes. I, t- I told you not to think of me differently when I shared that with you. I mean, I'm wrestling with the Holy Spirit. Okay, Lord. Okay, Lord. Okay. I want you to share with them what happened on Friday. No, I can't. No, but you don't have to be detailed. Just, you know, be a little bit generic. So I wake up, wake up Friday morning. Okay, Lord. Okay. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> Maybe this is for somebody here today. So by the way, I don't want to know if it's you that this is for, okay? Because <laughs> it's your fault. So on Friday morning, I wake up and I just got this sense that, oh my goodness, my mind is, you know, f- full of anxiety. My heart is troubled. I'm, I'm anxious. And I'm like, okay, Lord, all right, Lord. And I, I got this situation I'm dealing with, I'm praying about, I'm struggling with, and I'm like, okay, Lord. That's maybe too generic. Some of you are going, what, what are you struggling with, Pastor? No, it's not like that. I can, I can assure you. It's just a, a, a difficulty uh, in my life that I'm, I'm struggling with right now. And uh, it's, it's all good. It's nothing, you know, uh, uh, scandalous or anything like that. But I started finding myself just getting all worked up. And so I just went right to prayer. And when I pray, and this is just the way I'm wired, I I have to walk uh, and just talk to the Lord. And then he talks to me through his word. And as God is my witness, the peace that I experienced was instantaneous. And it freaked me out so much that I actually started going, Lord, uh, wait, I almost felt like I should still be worried. And it's like the Lord's going, you just got done preaching about this and you're still going to be preaching on this on Sunday. So what are you doing? I did exactly what I promised I would do. I gave you the peace of God as the God of peace. What is your problem? You know how it is when, you know, we worry because, you know, I lost my job. I, you know, I got laid off and, you know, I'm so worried. And then, so you pray and then God gives you peace and then God gives you a job and then you still worry. What if I lose my job? (laughs) Oh, see, I'm not alone, am I? Isn't that how we are? So here God gives me this peace. And it was like this. It was like, I'm going to take care of this. Don't worry about this situation. Stop worrying. I've got this. Okay, okay, I'll stop worrying. And then all of a sudden I was just baptized with this peace. And then... Minutes later, I start thinking, well, wait a minute, what, a, what if, and the Lord's like, hey, what are you doing? What are you, I don't know, I'm just so used to worrying. It's like if when I don't worry, it's like foreign to me, and I don't know what to do with myself. I'm so used to worrying. So the Lord's just, I've got this. You'll see. In fact, I want you to right now praise me and thank me in advance. And this was the word he gave me. And again, maybe this is a word for somebody here today. I want you to praise me and thank me on this side of your Red Sea before I part it. Oh, (laughs) because I'm going to part it but I want you to praise me on this side of the Red Sea. So I, believe you me, I did not feel like it. I'm like, and at first it was really awkward and I fumbled and I bumbled. It was like, Lord, thank you for what you're going to do. You're going to do it right and uh, praise you, Lord. And you know, you're going to part the Red Sea, right? And so, and then as I began to praise the Lord, and thank him in advance, a peace came over me, and I was so filled with this calm, 
all of my anxiety, all of my fear. And do you know that that situation was resolved by the afternoon? Yes. I, okay, there, I shared it, okay, Lord. Now the problem is I don't have much more time here to go through the rest of my outline. So bear with me. Four hows. Four hows. The first one is catch. And it's 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 4 through 6. Listen to what the Apostle Paul says. The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. And listen very carefully. We take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. And we will be ready, this is pretty strong language, to punish every act of disobedience once your obedience is complete. What's Paul saying? Uh, catch it first. Don't let it in. You know, some of us are so into our health, we're very careful about what we allow into our bodies. Some of us would never drink a, you know, diet soda or eat, you know, certain foods. But at the same time, we'll just allow anything into our minds. And the Apostle Paul is saying, you, you better catch that thing first and vet it, examine it, and see if it is obedient to and compatible with the Word of God, the Word of Christ. So here comes this thought, I catch it. And it creates fear in my heart. Stop right there. You cannot come in because God's Word says that He's not given me a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind so that I don't freak out or fall apart. No entrance allowed. The first how to overcome anxiety is to catch those thoughts before they're allowed to implant in the soil of our minds and sprout and germinate and bear bitter fruit. Here's the second how. Renew. This is a biggie. Romans 12, verse 2. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed. Transformed. How? How? By the renewing of your mind. Let me say it this way. I don't want to, uh, uh, I hope this doesn't jam anybody's gears. It's washing your brain from being brainwashed. You, you take the thought captive before that thought takes you captive. And you renew and cleanse your mind. You wash your mind before you're brainwashed. I think it was better the first time I said it. So anyway, it was, you get the point. It's a new way of thinking. Do not think on those things. Instead, think on these things. And when you do, your mind will become new. It's a new way of thinking. You know, some of us are so entrenched to this default way of thinking that we manufacture instantly the worst case scenario when something happens. All of a sudden now I, I feel this pain in my chest. I'm going to have a heart attack and die. Is my life insurance updated? <laughs> what am I going to... <laughs> it's indigestion. Take some Tums, man. What's the matter with you? I mean, that's, that, but this is how we think. 
That's the old way of thinking. Man, I got to tell you, I have to catch myself all the time. I mean, I'm walking in victory, please know. But, I mean, this side of heaven, as long as I'm in this fallen flesh, I'm going to struggle with this because of how I think. Number three, this is another passage that God has used in a powerful way in my life over the years. It's in Matthew 6. It's the famous Sermon on the Mount. In verses 19 through 34, let me just kind of give you the gist of what Jesus says. He says, the cure for worry is to transfer everything that you worry about. Let me say it this way. The more we have, the more we have to worry about. So transfer everything that you worry about, all of those treasures that you have here on earth, transfer them to heaven because where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. And if you will do that, then what happens is you will not worry about what you're going to eat, what you're going to wear, what you're going <laughs> to, the basic necessities of life. You won't worry about that because your heavenly Father will take care of you. Whenever, whenever we go to Israel, we go to the Mount of Beatitudes there, and I always teach from this passage because it is so beautiful, especially certain times of the year. And you can just picture Jesus there on the hillside, there on the Sea of Galilee, as he points to the birds that are flying in the air. And I can just picture him pointing to them, saying, look, look at those birds. Do you see them freaking out? Do you see them like building barns and stuffing it with worms so they have enough for next month's rent? So doesn't your heavenly Father take care of them? Yeah. Well, wait a minute. Aren't you more valuable than those birds? Yeah. I was created in His image. And then I can picture him pointing, and they would have been in bloom at the time, these beautiful flowers there on the hillside. And he says, look at these lilies. Do you see how beautiful they are? Even Solomon was not clothed as beautifully and as splendidly as these flowers. And here's the thing with these flowers. They're here today. They're gone tomorrow. And yet your heavenly Father clothes them so beautifully. Are you not much more valuable than that flower? Yeah. So then what's your problem? So then why are you running around to and fro, freaking out like the pagans? What am I going to do? What am I going to do? What am I going to do? What am I going to wear? I wore this last week. We open up our closets. I got nothing to wear. Are you kidding me? In verse 33, very famous verse, Jesus says, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all, not most, not some, <laughs> All these things shall be added to you. Therefore, verse 34, do not worry about tomorrow. And I wish he would have stopped there, but he didn't. He says this, for tomorrow will worry about its own things. Now, for those of you who are like me and worry I wish he wouldn't have said, tomorrow will worry about its own things. That means that tomorrow I'm going to a whole bunch more things I'm going to have to worry about. <laughs> That's not what he's saying. <laughs> 
Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. In other words, don't worry. I've got this. Lastly, we come full circle. The fourth how. Practice. Catch, renew, transfer, practice. I am blown away by what Paul says here in verses 8 and 9, our text today. I mean, he tells them, I want you to imitate me. It's not the first time he said it. I want you to see me as an example, what you've learned from me, what you've received from me, what you've heard from me. I want you to put it into practice because the peace of God, verse 7, will come from the God of peace, verse 9. In other words, they saw Paul as a man who was very calm, no anxiety, no fear, no fear, fearless, fearless. In the face of, well, you know what in the face of, you look at what happened to this man over his ministry. I mean, if there was ever a man who went through so much and had every reason to be full of anxiety, it was the Apostle Paul. He was one who could say this. What's he saying? He's saying, learn from my example and think on whatever is true. This is... <laughs> where the enemy gets me. Again, I'm being very candid. I hope it's not too uncomfortable. This is where the enemy gets me. I will listen to the lies of the enemy and start believing the lie. And then the Holy Spirit has to remind me, wait a minute, that's not true. That's not true. No wonder you're so full of fear. You're listening to, thinking on something that just, it's not true. It's not noble. It's just not right. And so then I, I think, okay, Lord, so that's true. That's not true. And I, that really didn't come out right. I should probably try to rephrase that. This is what I mean by we need to catch the thought. Wait, is that true? Is that true? If it's not true, then I'm not going to waste my time because it's not true. Is that right? Is that right? No, that's, that's wrong. Well, then I'm not going to waste my time thinking about that because it's not right. How about this? It's not pure. Impure thoughts? That's a whole other topic for another time. So I'm going to think on whatever is true, noble, right, pure, and is not what is true, noble, right, pure, lovely, magnificent, admirable, excellent, and praiseworthy. That's what I need to think on. He will keep you in perfect peace when your mind is stayed on Him. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank You. Lord, I pray that the Holy Spirit will take this to the next level in our hearts, in our minds, in our lives, as only You can, Lord. Because absent the Holy Spirit, we have no hope of having the victory in this area of our lives. Lord, thank you. In Jesus' name, amen.